Hello and welcome to the 2021 Hazard Mitigation Partners Workshop. My name is Danielle and I'm providing a few housekeeping items today before we get started. Today's session is on Adobe Connect. Therefore, to reduce any technical issues with audio, please mute your microphone and turn your speakers on. You can find those controls along the top of your screen. If you'd like to dial in via telephone today, please dial in using the telephone number located in the technical assistance pod on your left. If you're able, please join through the Adobe Connect application rather than the user, rather than the internet browser. This allows for a better user experience. If you do experience any technical issues today, please email us at FEMA-2021HMWorkshop at FEMA.dhs.gov. This email is also located in the technical assistance pod on your left. This workshop session is 45 minutes today. Please note that you can submit your questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A pod on the right of your screen. At the end of the session, we will have a series of polling questions for you that we will bring up on your screen. Following those polling questions, we will have a slide of quick links that will bring you to the next session, which is our daily wrap-up session today at 4 p.m. Please either click on the session you would like to join or you can join through the, the link in your email confirmation or your calendar hold. Lastly, on Adobe Connect, we do have files for download and links for use on the left-hand side of your screen. Thank you, and now I'd like to introduce Bradley Dean, Communications and Partnership Specialist within the Risk Management Directorate at FEMA. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Building Alliances for Equitable Resilience session. Uh, I'm joined by, by two great colleagues, Nikia Bradley, Deputy Director of Houston's Office of Emergency Management, and actually Washington, D.C.'s former State Hazard Mitigation Officer, and Anna Morandi, Program Manager uh, at the Sustainability and Resilience Program at National League of Cities. So today we're going to focus a bit on uh, some recent collaborative efforts that we've all been involved with. Uh, resulting resources that are available, but the bulk of our time we hope to spend on a really robust Q&A period where we'll have the opportunity to gain some amazing perspectives from both Nikki and Anna. So uh, next slide, please. So just a quick overview of the Resilient Nation Partnership Network. So it was formed in 2015 to cultivate relationships with non-traditional organizations, bring new voices to the table, and advance, really advance the resilient conversation in action. Uh, it's an opt-in peer network that's founded on community and knowledge sharing. It seeks to foster year-round collaboration to help address some of the biggest challenges that we experience in the resilience field. Um, our three priorities are promoting natural hazard mitigation actions, advancing equitable resilience initiatives, and expanding capacity through partnerships. So to date, we have over 600 organizations involved in the network. Uh, they represent all sorts of voices, industries, and geographies. And what, especially over the last year, I think we've really learned is that resilience has no sector, that none of us can do it alone, and we're all really invested in uh, a more equitable and resilient nation. So we're always looking for new and diverse organizations and individuals to join the network. So please feel free to get in touch with us. We'd be happy to welcome you. Uh, next slide. So, Kind of the foundation for this conversation really started in, uh, at least for this session, uh, started in October 2020 when the, the Resilient Asian Partnership Network hosted their, the Alliances for Equity Virtual Forum. Uh, it was an event nearly two years in the making, and it was originally scheduled to be held in 2019 uh, at NOAA's headquarters, but we shifted it to an online event where we held it every Wednesday in October, oh, October of last year. So by going virtual, we were able to expand our reach a little bit. We had uh, nearly 2,200 attendees throughout the four-week period, each week focused on a different topic. And 33 speakers really brought this event to life. We brought in a lot of uh, leaders from a wide range of backgrounds, nonprofits, academia, state and local governments, federal agencies, tribes, uh, the private sector, and more. Uh, the recordings are available if you'd like to see that on um, our uh, Resilient Nation Partnership Network website on FEMA.gov. Um, this dashboard that you see is really just kind of a quick summary of the impact from the event. But we knew that we needed to carry that conversation forward, and this was just the beginning of the collaboration with a lot of our external partners. So next slide. 
So following that forum over a six-month period, we worked with 26 partners to co-create the Building Alliances for Equitable Resilience resource. Uh, in fact, Anna was one of our primary contributors. And through this resource, we really seek to inspire the whole community to make equitable and resilient practices part of their day-to-day -day activities. So readers will find guidance, perspective, personal stories, resources, and more. I think one of the things that it's likely to come up in the conversation later is how much we leaned on the value of storytelling and personal story throughout this document to really make it uh, resonate a lot more on a personal level with people considering like the behavioral and social science and understanding that that's what is really going to make an impact and really promote change. And so again, this resource can be found on our uh, website on FEMA.gov and I'll be sure to uh, share the link. Um, next slide, please. I also would like to take the opportunity to highlight uh, an effort that was led by our FEMA Region 2 planners and now we're expanding uh, for, for national visibility. So this is the Guides uh, to Expanding Mitigation. It's, a, it's part of a series designed to highlight innovative and emerging partnerships for mitigation, uh, supporting the goal of uh, building a culture of preparedness. There are nine guides focused on the whole community, communication systems, equity, electric power, municipal financing, transportation, public health, agriculture, and arts and culture. Um, the Making the Connection to Equity Guide was also de uh, developed collaboratively, and Nia, Nakia was one of the individuals to help support that development of the resource. So I just wanted to kind of share those. Um, I'm going I hope that uh, we can share some links out into the chat uh, for each of those resources and the Resilient Nation Partnership Network website so that everyone has access to those. Um, and now what I'd like to do is we're going to transition over to a Q&A. And I promised I wouldn't take much time, so I, took, I think less than 10 minutes, so I'm happy that I went way under. But I wanted to make sure we, we shared a lot of this time because uh, I, I know Nakia and Anna are awesome, but now all of you will know Nakia and Anna are awesome. And so uh, with that, Nakia, uh, you're, just, you're on the left of my screen, so would you like to introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, I'm Nakia Bradley. Um, as Bradley mentioned at the top of the call, I'm the Deputy Director of the Houston Office of Emergency Management. Um, I'm in charge of our EOC operations and day-to-day and -day, um, interactions. I work really closely with our Chief Resilience Officers uh, as well, uh, Marissa Ajo, and a lot of our mitigation and resiliency efforts across our region. Um, I am formerly the State Hazard Mitigation Officer for the District of Columbia, and congratulations for finally getting statehood approved. And uh, lastly, uh, working with um, FEMA at Region 3 as part of uh, their mitigation team. So I did see a lot of my old colleagues since I've been uh, here in this particular event, and so happy to see you all and looking forward to our conversation. Hi, everybody. Oh, am I supposed to introduce myself, Brad? <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, people um, need to know who you are. It's a tough act to follow after uh, Nikio, but um, Anna Mirandi, I'm with uh, the National League of Cities. I'm a program manager there, and I oversee a grant program that uh, supports eight cities from across the country, different sizes and uh, different approaches to resilience. Uh, and so I, you know, I am not the person on the ground like Nakia. Um, I work with the folks on the ground. So I hear lots of stories. And so I think what I would love to share is some of those stories from the national perspective. Um, and I, I love my job. I love working with folks like Nakia who are on the ground, um, who are, are, you know, busy making those um, resilience efforts happen. And uh, I try my best to take those stories, amplify them, come here on webinars and talk about them so that other practitioners can hear about them. Um, so that's sort of my, uh, that's sort of who I am. 
Thanks for having me, Brad. Good to see you again. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for joining. So I as a, we everyone we hope you have a bunch of questions and I think there's like 146 people on here so I imagine we're going to get some questions. But <laughs> you just said wow. Um, they all want to listen to you so I I think this is just showing the excitement about the topic and the the fact that you all joined. So we're we're going to do is we're going to get started. I have two questions uh, that we can get started with while folks put their questions into the chat. Um, so the first one, I'm going to start off with you, Anna, and then we can go to Nakia, and then we'll swap it for the second question. So the first question is, where have you seen the greatest success for inclusive partnerships uh, that advance climate and natural hazard mitigation, and what was it about them that made them so successful? Yes, I love this question, because I think that partnering with local uh, community-based organizations and leaders and activists, um, that's really the ticket for local governments. Uh, I can really only speak on behalf of local governments, so this is, my perspective is really very, very sort of um, uh, uh, from their sort of point of view. And so, you know, one uh, project we actually just funded this year is the city of Raleigh, and they partnered with a local organization, um, an EJ organization, uh, uh, PEJ to uh, essentially uh, build capacity among residents and they created their own little cohort of, of residents. Uh, it's a bilingual cohort, which is really cool, Spanish and English, and they are uh, building capacity among residents uh, around flood mitigation and green infrastructure. And then those residents later get an opportunity to apply for funding for their proposed projects. So it's a really empowering program. And I think some of these, you know, the cities that I see the most success in are the ones that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, should I speak louder? <laughs> Getting a message here. Um, the cities where I see the most success are the ones where, you know, if, you know, there's staff turnover, things happen in cities, but if you have that partner on the ground consistently, or plural, even better, partners, um, the project can continue, you know, whether or not that sustainability director or that CRO changed over or whoever that was in charge of that resilience effort. Um, so I, I really think that, are you guys not hearing me? I'm sorry. Okay, um, I'm literally talking right into my headphones, so I don't, I'm not sure if I'll stay. <laughs> um, so, uh, anyways, yeah, so that's sort of the where we see the most success is with uh, uh, um, cities that are able to form very trusted partnerships, genuine, human to human, right? Not just ticking a box, like folks that you care about, folks that you, you know, folks you would even hang out with. Um, I think this is so important. The trust is really, really key and critical when you're working with local communities. Another place where I saw an excellent example of this is um, Anchorage, where they were trying, they, they basically recognized that after their huge uh, earthquake, I believe it was 2017 or 2018, uh, that their super diverse community, they have over a hundred languages spoken in that city. Uh, a lot of folks don't know that it's a very diverse community. Uh, folks were sort of out of the loop and, and, and the communities that didn't speak English um, really struggled on that day. And so what the city did was they brought uh, state, federal, I think there were FEMA folks there as well, um, state, federal, uh, and, and, and folks from the city together with community members to say, to sit down and essentially tell stories and say, what happened to you on that day? And residents were able to tell their story. They felt heard. They were listened to. Um, they learned about what the city is trying to do, what the state is trying to do. And then on the other side, the emergency managers were like, oh, wow, you know, we didn't even think about that. Like, oh, that's such an interesting idea. Or we didn't even realize that, oh, that road would have been blocked and you should have gotten that message through the alert. So it was this sort of two-way exchange. So I think I'll stop there. I just wanted to give those two examples. Nikita, your thoughts? So I think it, it's critical. When we, um, in emergency management, we're always talking about whole community. 
Um, this is where we need whole community more is in our planning efforts. I think we spend a lot of time um, in coordinating for disaster or after a disaster. But if we uh, engage more on the preparedness side and the mitigation side, that's where we gain the most. So some great ways I've seen that happen is a, a few ways. One of my favorites to talk about was um, in D.C. We had the equity advisory group that was led by the Department of um, Energy and Environment. Um, it was fantastic because it, it brought together a broad range um, of folks in an equity lens. Um, a lot of times when I hear equity, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is race. But they had everything from a high school student to um, a formerly incarcerated member, uh, first generation into uh, a neighborhood or someone's family that's been there for three generations. And I thought that was so key to bringing a, a true perspective of what your neighborhood is looking for, or what your neighborhood would like to see in these type of emergency plans, but also how to communicate. But what's the best way to reach the high school student versus maybe um, the third generation family members and getting all those family members to know what's going on, which was word of mouth, right? You know, one family member knew it and it was kind of like the phone tree and letting everyone else know. Um, another way that I've seen it work really great here in Houston, uh, we have a, a lot of strong connections to our community groups. We are actually working here to start um, two resiliency hubs. We have one in Cashmere Gardens which is a neighborhood that traditionally floods quite a bit, and working with their community to identify a location where they would like supplies to go. But folks are mainly interested in sheltering in place. Uh, they want to be able to just come and get resources or information, um, charge their phones, and so we're working with them to develop that. Um, another location is Spring Branch. And um, for them, they have almost the exact opposite. We would like to shelter here, or we would like to um, come and use the resources during the storm, but they had a unique opportunity to even bridge us even further and get connected with our supply chain. And they were asking um, to do a, uh, a pre-positioned contract with Kroger, which is physically across the street from that particular community center, that if something happens, they're not looking for someone to deliver food. They would just literally walk across the street and be able to get uh, the supplies needed uh, at that particular location. So I think that's where we see that whole community really coming together and really planning and being prepared um, and mitigating against some of the things that happen in their neighborhood. Awesome. Um, I think we're going to get it. We're going to dive into a, a, this is a pretty heavy question. And then we got uh, a question from Mike Hillenberg, Joy Brooks, and Kelly Flicka. So I, I want to acknowledge that we got your questions and we're going to get to those in just a sec. So um, this is kind of the big question that's that's really central to resilience and hazard mitigation and, and, and climate and pretty much really everything is that understanding populations are disproportionately impacted from climate and natural hazards. How can you know the resilience and hazard mitigation communities really begin to address needs based on the priority of those populations rather than sort of equal delivery. I think we're, we're getting to this understanding that everyone doesn't need the exact same thing. And so how do we adjust? Like how does this whole community of practitioners and people adjust to make sure we're providing the best possible support to the various needs that we experience um, Nikki, I'm going to start with you because not only do you arguably work in the most diverse city in the country, but I know that Houston and Harris County are really trying to be proactive about this. And so I was wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about what's going on and, and your perspective here. So with, here, but with partnership with Harris County, we're actually creating a climate uh, plan that focuses on minorities. Um, that kind of got some fun uh, stuff going on with the media and, and different political parties. It was kind of looked at, oh, well, the, the Democrats are pushing their agenda. And then the other folks saying, oh, well, it's the climate folks pushing their agenda. In reality, what's happened is when, um, based on benefit cost analysis, and if you've ever said in any speech, that's one of my hot buttons. But based on benefit cost analysis, naturally, the more expensive homes end up being the ones that uh, uh, prior, uh, prioritize for projects because they uh, give you more bang for your buck in, in repairing them. Um, however, we're taking a different approach to that and looking at our traditionally um, underserved and underrepresented uh, locations instead because those often have more repeat 
uh, claims or repeat issues, and that became more of a priority. Um, also, if you think about it too, in, in overall benefits of what's paid out in terms of like contents and losing um, uh, uh, continued assistance needed, uh, those particular neighborhoods end up needing more overall assistance that's not captured in a benefit cost analysis. So that's why we've chosen to focus on um, some of these underserved uh, locations and underrepresented locations because that gives us an opportunity to give more overall service to a location and help them rebuild back better and stay resilient. That it isn't like, oh, you know, we just helped you for this short period of time, but more long term we have a, a, a lasting effect by really helping these particular communities. And so that's why our, our shift in our focus has changed. Fantastic. Anna, anything yeah, you add there? Two words. Targeted universalism. So what is that? <laughs> um, I'm dropping a link in chat. Um, so this is a concept that emerged a few years ago from a really fantastic organization called the Othering and Belonging Institute from Haas Institute uh, at Berkeley. And uh, the idea there in short is that different communities have different needs. And so taking a universal approach to everything um, is probably not going to work. Um, and then taking a targeted approach at some communities sometimes can create a backlash in other, in other communities. Um, and so how do you navigate that space, right? So I had a community um, as part of our, 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 our cohort say, you know, we were sort of doing a scope of work scan and saying, okay, well, you know, what can we do for you? What would you like to learn more about? And they said, we are doing racial equity too well, and we are getting backlash. I said, okay, let's think about targeted universalism. So, so the idea is to really target each community for what it needs in order to bring it up to a particular goal. And so each community might need something different. And so that might mean something different in Houston, in New York, in Tulsa, wherever you are, and within those communities, it's going to make it's going to take sort of a different approach with, um, you know, like the black community or with the gay community or whatever it is that you know whatever the the um, policy or program you're 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 looking to um, implement is. And so, really targeting it to each community, connecting with those groups, connecting with those leaders, explaining it's all about the communication, right? If you're just like, hey, we're going to do this and you know, not really explain it, um, folks are, <laughs> you might get angry. But when you can explain it a little bit better, um, and that's, I mean, I think the challenge here is politics. And so often that just immediately, like Nikki was saying, like immediately people are like, oh, that's your agenda, that's so-and-so's agenda. So it is super tricky, but use, um, you know, messengers who are, uh, trusted in those communities to to deliver your message. You don't have to deliver it, you know. Work with folks who who know that community and can say, "Hey, this is something good. You need to get on board with this." So communication is key. But um, I encourage folks to look at that resource. It's really great. Um, I've been reading it, and uh, I, I, I'm I'm going to try to organize a training around it for my cohort because it's awesome. So. Awesome. So Mike Hillenberg had a question, and I love this question, and I, I, I don't know if I could even answer this because there's so many cool examples, but it was, who are some of the most unique partners you have worked with, and what did they bring to the table? So, um, you know, I'll go back, Nakia, what, what are thoughts on this one? I've had a lot of fun uh, partners to, to work with. Um, most recently during the winter storm, we worked with CrowdSource, which was very different for us to work with, and then finding all types of uh, different items needed by folks that we were uh, hearing from the community or residents during the winter storm that they needed. Um, so having CrowdSource and then being able to post on their site and finding folks to, to grab things for us was amazing. Um, we even had people that went out to check people's generators. Um, you know, with the winter storm, uh, we had... We don't put additives in our generators, or maybe this point forward we will. Um, and as the uh, 
as it, it got colder, the uh, at, the diesel would gum up, and so uh, we needed people to go out and check um, people's actual generators. And when they found that someone, um, we also had a uh, other folks in terms of. Um, working with us, everything from community centers naturally. We had our uh, faith base, our very strong, um, and all denominations because, like you mentioned earlier, Houston is diverse. So um, our, our Jewish synagogue stepped up. We've had um, our mosque. You know, so just all the different faith base um, has been really great. Um, we also had some folks, um, our fur babies, as everybody has them, uh, folks that set, up, um, that set up shop for critters. Because when we shelter, we can't just take certain types of pets. We have to take all types of pets. So snakes and um, I haven't got anything interesting like a peacock. But I've heard some stories of other uh, types of critters that uh, folks have. So we have um, uh, people who work with exotic animals um, come and help with us and kind of talk, talk about the best ways to help them shelter or if they can uh, come by and pick them up and they'll bring them back when the folks are um, ready to leave the shelter. So that's probably the most unique ones I've, I've ran into um, probably in the last year. I don't have any Honor. super cool stories like that, um, but I will say, <laughs> I will say that, uh, you know, I, I'll call out two cities that I think are, are partnering with, with great organizations. One is Orlando, and they're partnering with um, an organization called Ola to do uh, um, all kinds of work. And among that, they, you know, they recognize that, um, you know, folks are really into music and dancing and street parties. And so, uh, you know, one, one thing that they did when there were a ton of uh, um, folks leaving Puerto Rico after hurricanes Irma and Maria, uh, a lot of them uh, ended up in, in Orlando and Orlando welcomed them with open arms. And what did they do? They threw street parties and hosted and brought people together to say, you know, okay, not just like, you know, welcome to the community, but also, um, you know, here's, let's start to integrate and, and, and maybe we speak the same language, but um, maybe there's different cultures and, you know, obviously Latino culture is not a monolith. So, um, you know, I thought that was so creative and cool and that goes along again with that idea of like humanizing and storytelling and music and sharing. I mean, that is who we are at the core. And so we need to use these tools to, you know, even if you're like an emergency manager, I mean, come on, you know, right? Like this is, this is where we're at today. We need to start humanizing. Um, I love my emergency managers. That is not um, a diss on you guys. <laughs> We love you guys so much. Um, and so uh, another city that is taking a really amazing approach is uh, uh, another uh, of our cohorts, uh, cohort cities from this year, Alton, Texas. They uh, have a pretty considerable uh, undocumented population in their town. And so they partnered with a group called Lupe uh, to, to really ensure that that community is integrated into their discussions and is part of it. Um, I think, unfortunately, right now they are pretty uh, uh, kind of busy with the, uh, to say the least, with the, the crisis at the border. So, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that eventually they'll be able to engage more with our, with the city. Uh, and, um, you know, but I think the idea is there, the intention is there, and hopefully that will roll out soon. So, it's two. Yeah, I, I totally lied. I do have something to add. I'm not going to call out any specific partner, but I think, um, you know, this question is like every partner or organization or even individual does bring something unique. Like I know that that's kind of like everyone lets feel good, but like when you identify that, that's when the value of the partnership really goes through the roof, right? I think uh, this will little strike home with a lot of the, the DC natives and Nakia, but like we partnered with the National Building Museum a couple of years ago. They have a big build community day. And it's like, it's for families, it's for small children. And we were the only federal agency there. So we, we partnered internally with the Resilient Parks Network and Individual and Community Preparedness Division. And we had coloring books, we had a stream table, we had our virtual reality. And it was like, they were blown away because it was just a totally different way and perspective 
that the emergency management community or this mitigation community was interacting with people. And you got to have very casual conversations with parents while you entertain their kids. And if you want to get through to parents, I promise you, make sure their kids are getting educated, entertained simultaneously, and it, you'll, have, you'll be able to talk about whatever you want. It, it was a great thing, and it was just that, that one change. And then the other example I'll, I'll really quickly touch on is, um, I know Jake White actually presented uh, just before this, but uh, he works for the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. And I remember when we engaged him for the first time, he was like, hey, I don't, I don't know, and I, I wonder if he touched on this a little bit, but he was like, I, I don't know much about hazard mitigation or resilience. And it was at a time when we were co-hosting um, the forum with Noah, and we were like, hey, that's not what we need. What we need is a person that is an expert on engaging Latinx communities. And that's exactly what he brought to the table. And once we got past that, like, you don't need to be everything to everyone, which I think some people – like in some partnerships think they need to bring everything to the table, um, it was really fruitful and it really hit a need for the audience that we were trying to reach. So I, I just wanted to use those two examples. Um, uh, this is a good one and I have a feeling it hits on um, certain, certain questions that people are bringing in. So at a state or federal level, are there ways that we can ensure community-based organizations are engaged or better key partners in mitigation planning and implementation. I think this is a big movement I've seen from kind of moving outside of the traditional um, like hazard mitigation resilience framework to community-based organizations that really have trust in the communities and represent sort of the, that diversity. So um, Anna, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on how to engage community-based organizations mm -hmm. for this That's type a good of question. work? Um, well, we wrote, we wrote it into, it's like, I can't speak for, you know, sort of the, the inflexibility or flexibility of what the, um, of what federal agencies can do, but I can say that, you know, for, for us, we, we literally wrote it into the grant application. So we said we will prioritize cities that have partnered with a local community-based organization. Uh, so there was a lot, there were a lot of applications that were like, oh, we're thinking about this organization and we kind of wrote them in but I was like mm, yeah they probably haven't talked to them yet so <laughs> the ones that were genuine and I could tell yeah they've been working together I mean that was key right so um, I mean you could write it into your grants you could write it into programs um, that's that's like a, a, I think a pretty easy way to do it if that is something that you know agencies and um, can do um, maybe I'll think of something else so I'll let Nikita talk <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say micro granting helps a lot with that, where you give it to the community for them to decide what they want to do with it. We currently have one of those um, that hit the street about a month ago, and there were smaller grants of about 25K and the communities being able to decide what they want to do with them. I've also seen DC do something similar. Um, they did it in a community group. They uh, took it and painted, they, they cleaned and painted in the storm drain. So as you were saying a few moments ago, if you want someone to be involved, if your kid is painted in that storm drain, they want to keep it clean so everyone can see their painting. <laughs> so. Uh, th that was a great way of, of I mean, incorporation, in my opinion, and, and using micro granting to let the community decide what they would um, like to do with it. Um, also, I think an, another good way of, of connecting, we have a supply chain group here that is very, very active. Um, they have, we have big box folks in there, like grocery stores and, and, and local hard, uh, hardware companies in there. But we also have mom and pops that contribute into that discussion. Um, I, you know, uh, food truck vendors to, um, you know, uh, you know, just the gambit. Honestly, we've had a, that are part of that supply chain group. And so when we put the call out for something that we need, so like, like during the winter storm, we were having a very very hard time finding food because the power was out. And we put the call out, and hey, the turkey leg hut said, well, hey, we can put some turkey legs on the grill. That was awesome because that was just something that we needed in that supply chain, a local business, um, and they're not very big, but they're very popular. But they were um, they almost lightly almost started a riot at GRB when they pulled up. Um, I was like, next time, please come in the back. <laughs> People are very excited to see them. 
Um, so yeah, that was a great call out. Other things that we asked for, we asked for, um, you know, with the winter storm affecting so many people's pipes, we asked for, hey, do you have, can you donate some PCP vites and things like that. A lot of local businesses were like, hey, we're not doing construction right now. We'd be happy to donate these, you know, to the cause so folks can get their homes fixed. So those supply chain groups are really helpful to, to pull together of everyone from your chamber of commerce um, to all, like I said, even mom and pops, local businesses, small businesses to come together. And so, and you also find secondary connections to that because they work with smaller community organizations. Like it might be an after school program um, that they work with and that we have never heard of, but they'll bring to the table. Can you talk to preparedness about them? Sure, and then after that, I might want to partner for something else with that small group now that I know they exist. I second that idea. Yeah, that's great. And this question I have is actually kind of a, a follow-on to that. Um, it says, uh, the question's from Joy Brooks, and it was, how do you identify local activists and the community-based organizations you want to partner with, and have you approached them in the past, or do you seek them out? So, Anna, you mentioned that you literally built it into a grant proposal. I can say from our perspective with the, the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, we do a lot of research on who is the sometimes the loudest voice, who is the most respected voice, like who are those people that are doing something a little bit different on the ground, but not everyone has that, you know, like a, a team of people dedicated to searching out those people. So um, in your case, Anna, what is one of the ways where you have uh, maybe beyond just integrating it into a grants uh, proposal requirement, how have you either approached community-based organizations or how have community-based organizations uh, reached out to National League of Cities? Yeah, it's a little tricky because I, I work directly with the cities and then they work with part, part, local partners. So everything is a little bit like two, two steps for me. I'm not working sort of directly with that community-based organization unless they're they're a co-lead on the application which in the project which um, is the case in a few situations so they don't really come to us directly um, but like I said I think we really encourage it we try to prioritize it I try to always talk about it um, I just think that that is the way that uh, you really get that funding back into the community you allow the community to participate and co-create with the city. Um, and so I think, you know, federal agencies can kind of use that in inroads. Like if you're working with the city first and foremost, or a or, or local government or county government, um, you know, ensure that they're doing their due diligence, that they're working with local communities and encourage them to do that. So I think it's it's sort of like a, you know, they you may not have the local they, I mean, it's just scale, right? It's just, we're just talking about different scales of interaction here. And so when, you know, it's just about sort of, I don't know if I'm being clear about this, <laughs> being a little bit abstract, but that that community scale, it's harder, it's, it is harder for them to sometimes get to like connect with the federal level, right? It's so abstract and it's like forms and uh, and it's usually the city that has to apply for brick funding or the county that works with the state. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here that local community activists and, 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 and organizations maybe don't have the time to, um, to, to kind of, they're so busy, they're working on the ground. And so I think working with the city is a helpful way to do that and encouraging them to include those partnerships in their programs. And I love the idea about the micro grants and here. That's awesome. Like that's, not beautiful idea. Um, there was one other idea I had, and I t totally forgot. But I will, I will come back to it. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to you on it, Nikia. I think this is a really great uh, question for you because we know that establishing and fostering those relationships on the front end pre-disaster uh, really pays a lot of dividends when you get into response and recovery. So being a former state hazard mitigation officer and now working on the emergency management side, how is uh, how is Houston engaging all of these? I, I would imagine there are thousands of community-based organizations, and obviously this is front and center, you know, particularly post-Harvey and everything. Uh, what about what Houston's doing? So we are engaging them in multiple ways. We actually started an entire um, uh, department 
on focusing on small communities. Um, and so that, that person, that department seeks out smaller communities and make sure that we engage them. Um, our resiliency effort is huge here too and making sure that they're out in the community. And then we have me as an emergency manager. So we all three of us collaborate with each other. Like, oh, have you heard of this organization? Maybe you could talk to them about preparedness. Hey, have you heard of this organization? Um, I, I was, uh, there's something called Girls Inc. here. Um, which uh, focuses on, and I think they're nationwide, but we have a chapter here that's very active, um, and getting girls involved in all types of different uh, mentoring programs and, and uh, job opportunities, and they reached out to me, and I've been passing their name around to different folks, you know, and it's, it's, it's an exchange. I also get a lot of cold calls. Um, I, they call our main line out of, out of nowhere and say, hey, we want to talk to you the, the, the head of OEM and, you know, I make, make sure I do my due diligence to talk to everyone. I've had um, about two different people pitch me, you know, uh, like a crowdsource type of website to um, folks just wanting to know how do they um, get into the sheltering business or how do they, you know, help with sheltering. Um, uh, I, just a variety of things. So we get a lot of cold calls um, as well. And then uh, to, to be honest, like you were saying earlier, your, your, your loudest advocate or your loudest person who is in disagreement with you can be some of your best allies if you can get them to change the tide and see a different direction or give them the support that they're most unhappy with. Um, so, yeah, that, those are a couple things that I think of. And I know last year we took a very unique approach for COVID, right? So COVID, everything's been virtual. We haven't been able to do a whole lot. And we were going into summer thinking, like, what are we going to do about warming centers? Because that was still the height of COVID and, and congregating wasn't the idea. And um, someone came up with, let's give out air conditioners. I kind of cringed, like, that's expensive. <laughs> like, how are we going to give out air conditioners? But our supply chain partners stepped up. They started getting with some grassroots community folks. And we gave out air conditioners last year. And we gave out about 225 a week. And that was like an amazing effort that kind of was, a random thought and then but getting with the community members we were able to give a lot of seniors um, and those with function and access needs some air conditioners last year so who knew <laughs> that that's awesome and I, I think a lot of this is touching on that like strengthening the social fabric of a community just inherently like exponentially increases the resilience of that area and so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Nakia is so popular in this realm of people that she is getting questions texted to her while we're doing this instead of the chat. So Nakia, I know you had a question come into your phone. Um, did you did you get to that, or did you want to did you want to pose that? Now? No, I'll just I'll just toss it out really quick. And that was about the food truck. Um, I, during one of the other winter storms that was in D.C., they had a food truck that camped out at their OEM um, to provide food for them. And I thought, what a great way to be engaged with your small businesses. We often think just the same. And when this winter storm here came, that was my first thought of, hey, the power's out. Where do, where's the food truck? Someone has a food truck that they can bring out and serve up some food to these to folks that are at, by day three or four, you just want some hot food. I mean, to be honest, it was brick cold, and you were looking for just a hot plate of something. And so, yeah, we're, how can we organize our food trucks to help out? And I thought, what a great idea for small businesses to be engaged and make a little extra dough. Everybody hasn't really, especially food trucks, probably haven't made as much money during this COVID time and being able to uh, service folks. So um, it, it was a, a great idea. And they were like, make sure you bring up the food truck. <laughs> so wanted to toss that out as, as another uh, good practice and another way to engage in the community. If you don't know, um, if you don't know someone or know a community, find that trusted local business. I mean, I mentioned the turkey leg had almost started a riot, and I'm not joking; it kind of did. But they recognized it started as a food truck, and they have a restaurant now. But everyone flocks to it the second they see it, and that could be that driving force that could be helpful in a community as well with that trusted partner. Well, I I I don't think I've ever had this happen in any session I've ever been in. It's 3.45. We are, like, on the dot, I think, finished up on our time, right? I'm waiting for, like, someone running this to tell me that we're getting cut off because I, I know that we're going to be able to go forever on this topic. Can I say one last thing, Brad? 
Yes, Brad, we unfortunately. Can I add one last thing? Um, Go ahead. I'm, I'm such a yeah. huge proponent. I, I call myself a, net, a network node slash network nerd. Uh, please, please, please engage with all the available networks to, at your disposal. RNPN, um, Resilience 21, um, NLC. When you talk to folks from dip, from these networks, when you engage in the networks, that's where you really hear about like best practices, resources. You know, that's where you kind of learn about what everything is going on. You build friendships, you build relationships. Um, some of my closest friends now are from ASAP, the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. So. And this is just from being on calls with each other. And so, I mean, that's that's really where this work is being done is, is through um, trust building and, and friendships and uh, engaging with each other on a human level. I mean, what racial equity and equity is all about being human. And so if we're not doing that work ourselves and meeting new people and investigating, investigating ourselves, if you're not doing that, you're not doing the work, so. That's my end point. <laughs> I, I think those were fantastic closing words. Go ahead, Nakia. I was going to say, and don't be afraid to connect with us or other speakers you see. When you go to these conferences and um, you hear us talk or you hear other people talk, connect with them. I, I've got a lot of uh, good connections from people that they didn't ever have a di direct conversation with me at all, um, but I linked in them or I sent them a message hey, I heard your talk, uh, can we have a chat offline? Um, I, I remember getting this job last year and I got an inbox from Brock Long and I was all excited that, you know, the former <laughs> administrator, you know, reached out to me and he was like, wow, you got big shoes in a big city. And it was just like, wow, like you just even know my name. <laughs> so, but I think it's really neat that you uh, take advantage of the folks that you hear at these conferences because they do have a limitless um, amount of information to give, but also connection. This is, really is a six degree of separation industry, and that's where you get the connections. Where you can't find it in your city, you might call California or you might call New York, and those folks can reach out and maybe find a connection or, or a partner that can help you. So don't be afraid to do that and make connections. Perfect. Um, Thank you all for the time. I'll, I'll say um, we're sharing out our emails. Uh, I, I'm not going to speak for the – actually, I am because I, I know them both. Feel free to email at any one of us at any time with any of your questions. Um, I know that uh, we're, we'll all love to uh, get back to you and have those conversations. Uh, I'm going to finish with Nikia. This is a working title that I'm really going for. Uh, I'm really trying – I thought the Kevin Bacon of partnerships is like such a good tagline that I was going for with the six degrees of separation. So um, I, I'm, it's still in the works, but I think it's, it might stick. So um, I just want to say, say thank you to you both very, very much for joining us. Um, thank you to Hazard Mitigation uh, Partnership Workshop for having us. And I think that we're going to get kicked out of here. So thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks Brad. And thanks, Anna and Nakia. Um, so right now we're going to pull up just a few closing polling questions for you all. Um, your, your feedback is extremely valuable to us, so please let us know how we did today. Um, so we'll leave that up for a few moments. And then in just a second, we will bring up another slide that features a link to our daily wrap-up session, which begins at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so again, we'll bring up that slide, and you can either click on the link, and it will bring you directly to the room, or feel free to join through the unique meeting link in your email confirmation. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you in the next session.